Good evening or good afternoon or good morning, everyone, wherever you might be. I guess for Frederick is good morning. For us, it's good evening. I'm very happy that we managed to set up a decent competition to Joe Biden. And we'll have a beautiful talk by Moritz Weber about quantum symmetries of finite graphs. And let me note that uh, Moritz is not our first time speaker. You already gave a talk at my seminar some years ago, right? That's right. But, but it was without Zoom. I, I guess that then nobody knew what Zoom was. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I think it was 2015, guess. in fact. Yes, yes. So, wow, almost six years ago. Great. So now, quantum symmetries of finite graphs. The floor is yours. Take it away. Yeah, hello, everybody. Thank you for <laughs> attending the talk. and. Uh, for, for choosing this one over some competing event. So uh, in <laughs> fact, I, I will now uh, share a link to the slides. So the slides of yep. my talk are already online on my webpage. Perfect. So if at some point you feel like you wanna leave this talk for whatever reason, you can, you can take a look at the slides. So I'm, I won't be offended. <laughs> okay, so uh, in, in my talk, uh, it's, uh, it's a survey talk. So I will uh, speak about quantum symmetries of finite graphs. So this means I will mainly introduce to the subject and give an um, idea of what people are interested in. Uh, so, so it won't be so much about my, my own work. Uh, it will be more about uh, yeah, the, the subject as such. And uh, I hope it won't be too um, elementary in the beginning, but um, I don't know, some, some people might have not have the, the, the background for this stuff. So I try to start it smooth. And then uh, towards the end, we will list a couple of results and then maybe we will accelerate a little bit. But as a cherry on the cake, you will give some of your new results as well. Yeah, some, yes. <laughs> okay, so let me, let me uh, tell you first a little bit about the context and then later we will speak about the objects of interest and about some, some results. So uh, the context is um, very wow. general. Uh, it's about quantum groups. Whenever you speak about quantum groups, you should be a little bit more specific what kinds of quantum groups you're talking about. So in this case, uh, I will speak about analytic uh, quantum groups. There's also some algebraic approaches, but uh, we will uh, more stick to the analytic uh, setting. And in this analytic setting, um, which uh, was given by, by Voronovich, uh, there are several um, classes and uh, the, the largest one is locally compact quantum groups. Uh, more specific are compact quantum groups and even more specific are compact matrix quantum groups. So this will be our guys. And in particular, uh, I will speak about uh, quantum uh, automorphism groups of uh, graphs. So, so these, these are situated somewhat here. So it's a subclass of compact matrix quantum groups and they also have some, some classical counterparts. Mm -hmm. And uh, so here, here's the, the border between the quantum and the classical world. So this shall just give you a slight impression of, of where we will be uh, in this talk. And uh, I, I think probably the, the main information is that we're here in in the realm of compact quantum groups, mm -hmm. as defined by Voronovich. So maybe uh, let me uh, very briefly uh, give a, 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 a larger um, context, namely quantum mathematics, so uh, or non-commutative mathematics. So this is a non-standard. Sorry, terms. Maurice, there is a question. May I? Oh. Really... There sure. is a question from Alex. Why are there some groups not covered in the analytic part? So if you can go back to the previous slide. <laughs> if this is a question. How would you answer it? Well, I mean, this is just a scheme, right? I mean, uh, so so groups here that they are maybe maybe here you should uh, forget about this too strict line between analytic and algebraic. I mean, here I'm I'm, I'm just uh, uh, sketching a little bit that we have these quantum groups and also this subclass of, of groups. And uh, I, I guess mainly uh, I I, I, I uh, mentioned this this uh, group <laughs> class here because. Uh, some of my objects will be classical uh, symmetry groups of the graph. So that's, that's just the, the only thing here. But maybe I can also mention the following that uh, uh, you can have Hopf algebras which are not semi-simple and then they do not correspond to an analytic quantum groups in any way whatsoever. So, so in this way, it answers Alex's question that they are not covered and we have many Interesting. For instance, it's very interesting in the finite dimensional uh, setting, right? Is, is, is that you have some Hobb algebras with nice new potents and so on, and they are not semi simple. 
like the roots of unity and so on so, so forth and 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 uh, uh, they are not covered by the analytical theory i think fons van dale wrote some very interesting uh, paper on trying to find an analogy between finite dimensional of algebras that are not sister algebras and then a, some locally compact quantum groups so that he, he found some nice parallels but, but of course, everything trivializes when you assume both that you are in analysis and in finite dimension. Then things are relatively boring. Mm -hmm. But but if you drop one of these assumptions, I mean, you go to infinite dimensions, but you have all these analytical requirements. When you have a nice theory, on the other hand, you drop analytical requirements. Uh, you have just finite dimension, but you still have a lot of room to play with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry yeah, for so, the interruption. No, that's 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 perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> So uh, in, in fact, um, this is some, some of the more specific uh, context, but the more broader context is uh, what, what I would like to call quantum mathematics or non-commutative mathematics, although this might not be a, a standard term um, yet. Uh, however, you, you, you should be familiar with this uh, concept, so it's probably not really something new for you. For instance, uh, if you have topology, then uh, C star algebras can be seen as some non commutative version of topology, right? So you have the mm -hmm. famous Gelfand Neimarkt theorem, which tells you that uh, the commutative C star algebras are exactly uh, the compact Hausdorff spaces or the functions on, on these spaces. So, in a way, we say that commutative C star algebras are topology and non commutative C star algebras are non commutative topology. And such a theorem also holds for, for measure theory or uh, for Alain Kohn's differential geometry, where mm -hmm. classical manifolds are again the commutative situation and non-commutative ones are those covered by Kohn. And you also have some probabilistic concepts, namely uh, free probability and uh, uh, some quantum probability. And our friends for, the, for this talk will be the locally compact mm -hmm. quantum groups. And I just listed a, a couple of theories that deal with quantum in, in some sense. And I, I think that the nice thing is that uh, more and more we get a feeling of for, for, for the interaction between these, these fields. Like for instance, in uh, topology, um, you, you could say groups uh, describe symmetry of topology. And in the same sense, we could say quantum groups describe uh, symmetry behavior for C star algebras. Or sometimes you're interested in some probabilistic uh, questions uh, in, in whatever context. And uh, so, uh, you should have a, a same thing on, on the uh, quantum side here. I mean, th this is really just a sketchy thing. And uh, as I said, this is just a very loose uh, table. Probably some things are, are missing. So, so I think maybe in the chat, uh, yeah, there, there, there are some, some things mentioned that, that are missed, namely uh, metric spaces. So uh, I mean, th this is incomplete, but uh, in my feeling, um, I, would, would say that uh, these, these theories, they developed um, separately for uh, some, some time and we, we now get a better feeling for the interaction. Okay, so this maybe just a little bit for, for the context, maybe uh, this can also be discussed after the talk if, if you're interested in, I, I would be interested in seeing more perspectives on whatever this quantum mathematics uh, should be or where, where the directions uh, are for the future. But now let me come to the to the object. So let me be more specific about uh, what uh, we're, we're talking here. So just to be on the safe side, let me quickly define compact matrix quantum groups. So this has been uh, done by Voronovich, uh, our hero from quantum groups uh, from the 80s. And uh, the definition of a compact matrix quantum group is as follows. You have a C star algebra A, which is unital, and it's generated by certain elements U, I, J. And uh, if you put these n square elements into a matrix, then these matrices, they shall be uh, invertible. So the matrix itself, but also the matrix formed by the adjoints of these elements. And you should have a, a star homomorphism from A to the tensor product of A with itself, uh, which is of this form. So whenever you're in this setting, this C star algebra generated by this Uij together with this star homomorphism, and uh, these invertible matrices, then we would say we, are, we have a compact matrix quantum group. And there are a couple of fundamental theorems proven by Voronovich uh, from again in the 80s. And uh, the first theorem is that uh, if my C star algebra in this definition up here uh, is commutative, 
then in fact, um, it is a function on some compact space by Gelfand Neumark. And uh, we see that this space has in fact the structure of a compact group, of a compact matrix group. So it's a subgroup of GL and C and vice versa, any such compact group uh, gives rise to a compact matrix quantum group by uh, taking the functions on this group. So this means you can, you can, you can view this. So here, here is Gelfand Neimark on this equivalence sign. Uh, you can view this as a Gelfand Neimark theorem in the theory of, uh, of quantum groups, right? Mm -hmm. Again, the commutative situation is exactly the group situation. So this means quantum groups are a larger class. They cover groups and they extend it, okay? Something more general. <laughs> So that's a very nice uh, um, theorem because it tells us that we do exactly the right thing in the philosophy of this uh, quantum mathematics or Gelfand Neimark in this philosophy, commutative equals classical situation. There's also some more, namely we can do Haar integration on these quantum groups. So there is some, some um, Haar state, a state is an analog of an integral. Uh, we also have some link uh, with our algebraic friends, namely there's a dense Hopf algebra. So if you, if you see this, this map delta here, you might think of a co-multiplication and uh, that's not so far from the truth because you can also find an antipode and a co-unit and then you will find a dense Hopf algebra uh, in this algebra up there. And also we have a very nice representation theory for these objects, namely some, a kind of a Tanaka Krein or if you want Schauweil, duality and uh, this tells you that the representation theory can be given in very abstract categorial terms. Okay, so these theorems are probably well known to, to many of you, in particular people in Poland, uh, I suppose, but uh, nevertheless, I just wanted to, to list these, these nice uh, theorems that we have here. So let me now come uh, to uh, more specific objects, namely the quantum permutation group. So this is one particular class of a compact matrix quantum group. This has been defined by Shuzu Wang in the 90s, and it's given as follows. Uh, you, def you take the universal C-star algebra generated by uh, elements uh, uij that satisfy these relations here. So the uij's, they are orthogonal projections, and uh, in their rows and in their columns, they sum up to one. Okay, so this is a definition of a universal C-star algebra. If you don't know what a universal C-star algebra is, then just think of a free algebra with these generators, you mod out these relations, so these polynomials, and then you find a good uh, C-star norm on this guy. And uh, this is our, our definition. Of course, we need to check that it's really a compact quantum group. So we, we, we shall get, go back to the, to the definition of Fodanovich. So, so you see it here. So what, what we shall check is, that uh, our C star algebra is really generated by certain UIJs. Okay, that's, that's the case because uh, that's, that's just by definition, it was the universal C star algebra generated by such elements. Then we shall check that, it's, uh, that these matrices are invertible. Okay, you can just take a look at these algebraic relations and uh, work it out. So, so this, this can, be, can be done. And then you need to check that uh, the relations also pass to such a star homomorphism. And then by the universal property of uh, this universal C star algebra, you will find that such a star homomorphism exists. Okay, so this means you can, you can really uh, check these axioms of a compact matrix quantum group. It's not um, too difficult to do. And uh, we obtain a, a quantum group. So now it's called the free symmetric uh, quantum group. So it should have got to do something with the symmetric group. So with permutations, how it comes. Well, let's take a look at these, at these relations here and let's take a scalar valued matrix and let's plug, uh, plug it in. So what, what, what do we see? Well, I see that the, the entries of my matrix, so now my UIJs are scalars for a moment, the entries are real, so that's the first relation, and they're idempotent, so the only possibilities is zero and one. So if I take these relations here and I, I uh, ask for a, for a scalar valued or a complex valued a solution, then my only possibilities are zero and one. And what does this other, other relation mean? Well, it means that in the row, the rows shall sum up to one. So I only have zeros and ones in my row, they shall sum up to one. This means in my row, I have exactly one 
unit and all the rest are zero. And the same for columns. And this means exactly that whenever I have a scalar valued matrix satisfying these relations, it must be a permutation matrix. And vice versa, any permutation matrix satisfies these relations. So this means these magic unitary relations, that's, that's how we call them, a scalar valued uh, matrix is a magic unitary if and only if it is a permutation matrix. And this means that I will find a surjection from my C star algebra to the functions on the permutation group, namely mapping this UIJ to the uh, evaluation of the IJth entry. And uh, in this sense, we would say that uh, the symmetric group is a subgroup of SN plus, or if you want a quantum subgroup. So we have more quantum permutations. Okay, so this is, this is the, the, the message here. In the quantum world, we have more ways of quantum permuting something. Okay, so this is uh, the, the, the first thing we check. Yeah, I, I, will, I will say a little bit more about quantum permutations in a second to, to get a better feeling for, for this, for what this shall be. Let me just mention uh, some open question at this point, namely uh, it is uh, open whether there is some quantum group sitting between SN and SN plus. Mm -hmm. So we don't know whether there's any quantum group um, that sits in between here. And this is the, the, the precise formulation this is over here. So you need to find a C star algebra uh, sitting between the one of SN plus and the one of the functions on SN. Uh, and uh, it should satisfy these, these relations here. If you find such a guy, then uh, we would be very interested in seeing this example in the quantum group community. So sorry, may I ask, uh, is sure. it open for every n? Because I remember that for n equal to four, it was an open problem. And maybe for some higher n, it was solved or I don't remember. That's, that's right. Okay, so, so for n equals four, uh, we, we know that there's, that there's no such intermediate quantum group and for n equals five uh, as well, but for others it's, it's unknown, yeah. So for, for small n, also for n equals three and, and smaller uh, Sn and Sn plus coincide. Mm -hmm. So for small n, the, this uh, question is, is settled, but for larger n, we are, we're still lacking of proof. And is my intuition correct that you would like to have a situation uh, in which uh, some subset of your n element set is permuted by classical permutation and the rest by arbitrary quantum permutation. Maybe this would be idea for such a quantum group in between. Yeah, so I mean, in, in, in that case, probably you would, you, you, you would, maybe, maybe that's too much to ask because then you really okay. split the classical and the quantum part. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it's a bit difficult um, to, to get a, precise intuition for, for what, what this really means. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 it means something that you're, you're in, in a way you're right that some UIJs uh, have some commutation relations with, with exactly. others. Yes. And, uh, but the, it, it could also be that, I don't know, a monomial of length seven commutes with another monomial of length eight. And then it, it would be not so easy to, to say, what, what does it mean here now? Well, of Something's course, no, that, that's much I understand. I was trying to uh, get a hold of this problem in some intuitive uh, manner, simplifying, you know, like an ansatz in physics. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's, it's probably definitely a, a reasonable ansatz, but um, yeah, I, I, I think when, when you really want to construct such an example, it will be more complex than this. Yeah. I so, sorry, if I understand, uh, there is uh, no example at all where you have uh, a G, uh, in between, I mean, that's right. There is no known example. That's correct. There's okay. no known example. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, so, so this is a little bit about this uh, quantum permutation group. So maybe let's now take a, a closer look at this at this quantum permutation. So, so how how can we think of these uh, guys? Uh, so let's try to think of elements in this SN plus. Although this is a bit tricky because. Uh, as, as you know from, from non-commutative geometry, we're defining our non-commutative spaces not by elements, but by the functions on this space, right? Think of the non-commutative torus. Uh, you, you would not dare to say, uh, this is a point on the non-commutative torus, but you would rather say, I consider the functions on the, uh, the non-commutative torus as such. So here, here it's a little bit the same, so it's difficult to, to speak of elements, but we can think of representations of this, of the C star algebra. And uh, maybe let, let me um, give you a, a kind of concrete one. Namely here, let's, let's say this is a permutation matrix. So uh, as you know, just zeros and ones as an entry. 
So uh, what, what does it do? Well, it sends the first particle uh, to, the, to the third position, right? So this is a permutation. It sends the first particle to the third position and the <laughs> second one to the first and the third to the fourth and so on. So this is a permutation as you know. Mm -hmm. So now here is a two by two matrix where the entries themselves are matrices, mm -hmm. right? So the, the entries now are two by two matrices and uh, you can check that they, they satisfy all the relations of this SN plus, namely all the entries are, uh, are uh, projections, uh, orthogonal projections, and in the rows and, and columns, they sum up to one, right? Mm -hmm. so if, I, if I take such a, such a column, uh, the elements sum up to one. So this is a, a, yeah, a matrix that satisfies the relation of this SN plus, and now you can you can see what what, what does this do with the first uh, with the first uh, particle? Well, it sends it a little bit to the third position and a little bit to the fourth, right? So this is pretty superposition of states. Uh, yes. So for 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 this particular um, column, but but here, uh, I mean these 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 projections they they really they they don't commute, right? So mm -hmm. it's really uh, a pretty non-commutative situation here. Mm -hmm. And also this, uh, we can take this example as a, as a starting point for, for saying that uh, S4 and S4 plus uh, are really different. I mean, S4 plus is really substantially larger than S4. And here's a, here's a small argument. Namely, there is a representation uh, from, from C of S4 plus to, to this C star algebra. And mm -hmm. we map uh, this, this matrix U to this matrix. So uh, U11 is mapped to zero, U12 is mapped to P and yes. so on. And you can check that this matrix on the right satisfies the relation of S4 plus. So this uh, um, star homomorphism exists by the universal property mm -hmm. and it is surjective, but the C star algebra on the right hand side is non-commutative. So this proves that uh, C of S4 plus is non-commutative and this means that this canonical surjection from S4 plus to the functions on S4 is not an isomorphism, okay? Correct. Okay, so maybe I, I should also take care of, of, the, of the chat. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, how does one choose P and Q or are they free to choose here? Okay, yeah, in, 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 this, in this particular example, I'm, I'm, I'm really taking this, uh, this universal C star algebra generated by uh, two projections. So this is a universal C star algebra. So this means this settles already my, my choice of the P and Q. But uh, if, if you want, you can, you can take this, this very uh, particular uh, example that, that I just wrote here, right? So, so this, this, will, this will map to some, some bounded uh, uh, operators on, on M2. And uh, so, so the elements then will not will be non-commutative. So this also proves that S4 plus is not commutative. Okay, so may maybe I, uh, yeah, th th thank you for the answers in the, in the chat. So maybe I, I leave these, these answers as, mm -hmm. a, as an alternative answer. So this means um, for, the, for the moment, we, we know that we have this uh, quantum permutation matrices and we think of them as uh, permutation matrices where the entries themselves are matrices, okay? It's a matrix of matrices, or you can say a matrix valued matrix. And this is how we can imagine these quantum permutations, okay? I mean, it's a bit shorthand because my definition of uh, this S for SN plus was a universal C star algebra. So in general, we should have uh, operator valued. So not only matrices, but um, it's a, it gives a good intuition. Here uh, is also something on, on, the, on the quantum, um, on, on this uh, symmetric quantum group, namely it is the quantum symmetry of endpoints. So what are endpoints for non-commutative geometry? So, and, so here we, we have an n elementary set, but of course we're not interested in the set itself, we're interested in the functions on the set. So what is the function on this n elementary set? Well, it is the universal C star algebra generated by n projections which are orthogonal and sum up to one. Okay, so this is how we can write this, this uh, functions on, on endpoints in a, a more sophisticated way if you want. And now let's, let's uh, recall that classically, 
the permutation group acts on endpoints. Okay, it's a symmetry of endpoints. So what does it do? Well, here, here's, here's the action. We can dualize this action to the quantum group setting by saying, okay, uh, this is what, what, we, what we understand by an action of SN plus on this uh, endpoints. So we want to have a star homomorphism defined in this way. And there's also some, in general, there's also some, some density conditions, but uh, let's not care about this too much for a moment. But uh, we, have, we have this uh, star homomorphism here. This means we have an action of SN plus on XN. And uh, this star homomorphism exists in fact. So we can, we can just check that. So for instance, we need to check that uh, PI prime square is again PI prime. So PI prime uh, square is, uh, is this object here just by definition. And now from the orthogonality of, of the projections PK and PL, uh, I obtain that, that, that I only have this sum here with the UIK square tensor PK. Now UIK K square equals UIK. So this means I just end up with PI prime. So I just checked that uh, if, I, if I take this element in this tensor product, product uh, of my C-star algebras, then this element will be an idempotent. And I can also check it's self-adjoint. I can check that it sums up to one. So I can check that, so that, that it satisfies all the relations of my universal C-star algebra. So I get this star homomorphism. So I can really directly check that uh, my, my quantum group SN plus acts on, on these endpoints. And in fact, it's maximal with this action. So that's a very nice thing because whenever you take any other compact matrix quantum group acting on these endpoints, then uh, from this relation, I mean, this star, suppose that we have another quantum group and such a star homomorphism as above exists, then we know that the images uh, must be idempotent and we can we can just trace back this this computation from here and uh, and make it backwards and then from these relations we can uh, infer that our elements of this arbitrary quantum group must be idempotent so in this way we can check that whenever we start with an arbitrary quantum group acting on these endpoints in this sense then it must satisfy all the relations of sn plus so it will be a subgroup of sn plus and this means that sn plus is maximal with this action in this sense, we would say SN plus is the quantum symmetry of N points. And this is also a very nice example where you see that the quantum world is superior with respect to the classical world. Because if you're asking, what is the symmetry of N points? A classical person would say it's the permutation group. And a quantum person, person would say, no, I know more symmetries. It's the quantum permutation group, OK? So, but are we asking that these projections are orthogonal? This yes. is a commutative sister algebra, right? It's a commutative sister algebra, yes. And so they are the, still orthogonal after coaction, right? Yes. So, so, so from, from this relation, it, it follows that the uh, projections are orthogonal. Ah, okay, thanks. Hmm. Okay, so this means uh, this notion of quantum symmetry group is, is uh, or symmetric quantum group is, is really also justified from this point of view. It's the quantum symmetry of, of endpoints. So this is nice because now we can uh, come to our main objects of interest, namely quantum automorphism groups of graphs. So let me first tell you what is a classical automorphism group of a graph. So we take a finite graph, let's say on endpoints, and let's suppose we have an adjacency matrix uh, epsilon with values only zero and one. Yes, so make sure only... your, your graph is directed, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. my, my, my graph is directed, or uh, if, if you want to have it undirected, then uh, you, you, you throw in both arrows, and uh, so in, in both directions, but uh, we have no multiple edges, right? So no, no multiple uh, arrows between points. And also, uh, yeah, so, so that's, that's the main, main point for the moment. And also we have no self loops um, and that's, that's a technical thing we can circumvent in, in, in one way or another, but uh, the main point is uh, no multiple edges. Mm -hmm. And then we would say, what are the symmetries of a graph? Well, uh, we want to permute um, these vertices such that this uh, edge connection is, is respected. So this means whenever two vertices are connected before applying our automorphism, they shall also be connected afterwards and vice versa. So this is this relation here. It, um, I mean, it, maybe it's, it's more natural to, to write something like uh, sigma epsilon sigma inverse, 
So then you would see that uh, this adjacency matrix is invariant under adjoining with this uh, permutation. So we only allow those permutations of the vertices that uh, respect the adjacency matrix. And this is the automorphism group in a, in a classical sense. And this is what we call the symmetries of uh, the graph. And you don't care about the direction in which they are connected. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, it's, 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 it's here in, in the adjacency matrix, right? Yeah, so, but, so you can have X uh, maps uh, uh, an arrow into Y. And when you flip y and x, so now we have y mapping an arrow into x. That's OK. Yeah, I mean, I, in, in, if it, 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 it depends a bit on, on your, on your, on your uh, adjacency matrix, on your concrete example, right? I mean, uh, we, we, we can take care of, of directedness, and then, and then uh, we, we really need to satisfy this uh, relation here, right? I mean, if, if, you, if you swap these, these arrows, uh, you mm -hmm. might destroy some some symmetry, right? It depends on the graph whether you're allowed to do that. Well, so just think about a simple graph: uh, two vertices and one edge in between them. Yes. And now I, I'm I'm asking whether the permutation which exchanges uh, the two vertices is okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, if the graph is uh, not oriented, it's not okay. The graph is oriented. If it's a uh, one-way arrow, then it's not, of course, right? Yeah, that, that, that's right. I mean, if, 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 you're, if you're thinking of, of, of this graph, then what, what Piotr said was, was okay. But if, if you think of this graph, uh, then, then it's, it's not okay, right? All right, so now I'm thinking about the second graph. So, so, so actually this is not okay. Okay, it's good to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Theo Banica de defined uh, the quantum automorphism group. So he said, okay, let's 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 take a look at, at, at this guy. So it's a subgroup of S n with this additional relation. So let's just define it in the same way on the quantum uh, setting. Namely, we take the relations of S n plus and we add this relation. So it's really just like for the automorphism group, we, we define it in exactly the same way. So again, a universal C star algebra generated by UIJ and uh, with these relations, and this shall be. Uh, our definition of a quantum automorphism group of the graph. Again, we can check it's a compact matrix quantum group, so, so it's okay. But we can also see that uh, we have a surjection from this C star algebra to uh, the functions on the automorphism group, just like um, we explained in the previous slide. And we have this, this uh, commuting diagram. And uh, philosophically, it uh, translates to, to this diagram here, right? So we defined a quantum subgroup of SN plus. Uh, which contains uh, the classical automorphism group. So this is really just, just like the, the way we defined SN, SN plus as in quantum generalization of the permutation group, we now have a quantum generalization of the automorphism group of, of gamma. And we say that the graph has quantum symmetries if this inclusion is strict, or in other words, if this C star algebra is non-commutative, that's equivalent. So this is our definition of a graph having quantum symmetry. Some, some graphs might uh, admit a non-commutative C star algebra of this form, but there are other graphs uh, where even if you start with this non-commutative C star algebra here, or seemingly non-commutative C star algebra here, uh, you will see that these relations u epsilon equals epsilon u are so strong that they force the, the uij's to be uh, commutative. So this is a a uh, strange phenomenon, and I, I will give you an, a couple of examples on the next slide. Uh, but uh, it, it, it's, this is really a non-trivial um, definition. Some graphs have quantum symmetries, others don't. Yeah, so related to what you just mentioned, uh, uh, what is the size of quantum symmetries? Because when you look at permutation groups, quantum permutations groups, they grow in size very drastically. Right when you move beyond this n equal four and so on, these are huge infinite dimensional sister algebras, right? Yes. And they can be given by some free products if I remember correctly. Uh, but now what happens with uh, graphs? Take a generic uh, graph, which is finite, which has this nice adjacent matrix as you mentioned here. So no self loops, no multiple edges between vertices. And for such a generic graph, uh, when you say increase the size of the graph by increasing the size, the number of vertices, uh, how big is the growth of a quantum automorphism group? When it does well, become I, infinite dimensional immediately or, or, or? 
Well, that, that, that's a subtle question. So, uh, so there, there, there's uh, two answers to, to that question. The, the first thing is, um, I, I cannot really control the, the growth. The growth. So, so I, I have no statement on, on, the, on the growth here, in fact. Mm -hmm. And uh, even uh, the, the question of finite or infinite dimensionality is not uh, entirely clear to us. So uh, in, in real life, when, when you give me a graph and I, I find out that it has quantum symmetries, then the C-star algebra will be uh, infinite dimensional. So it will be, will be large. Mm -hmm. But uh, I cannot uh, give you an argument that they must always be infinite dimensional. So this is, again, another open question. We don't know whether there is a graph which has quantum symmetries such that this C-star algebra is finite dimensional. All right. So, so if you just fix the number of vertices, you might still uh, have a graph which is sufficiently malicious that it will not allow you for infinite dimensional quantum symmetry. Yes, in principle, yes, but uh, we have no statement here and that's yeah. not clear to us. Mm -hmm. Maybe a, a, another statement, so, so since, since you mentioned a generic graph, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I mean, th there is this Erdos-Rini type uh, result that uh, if you pick a generic graph, it won't have symmetries, right, mm -hmm. at all. So the automorphism, the classical automorphism group of a generic graph uh, is, is uh, just a trivial group. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will come to a, a similar statement for, for a quantum groups uh, in, in a couple of slides. Okay. But uh, let, let me just, a, oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, can I Go ask ahead. a basic question? Yeah, um, sure. So um, like, like in this analogy, I'm like, so the UIJs, they correspond to, uh, to a single permutation. Is that, is that true? Like one u i j for fixed i and j. Well, the the the, the single u i j itself not so. So I, I would say this is more the entry of a permutation matrix. Um, um, but if if you so, if you put all these u i j's in, in in a matrix and if you let's say evaluate it by by finding a, a representation of the C star algebra, then then you could say this is a, a quantum permutation matrix. But but the the single u i j itself. I would rather say it's an entry of a permutation matrix. So what I'm struggling with is like uh, I'm like there's this I'm like that that this magic unitary um, description. Uh, so how does this come from uh, from permutation groups? Like I'm like this these like uh, relations where these come from? Um, so so in in fact they 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 really come from from a, a permutation uh, matrix. So here if you take a permutation matrix. And you should not think of uij as a permutation matrix, but of the whole matrix u. So of, of mm -hmm. u uh, formed by all these uij's. Mm -hmm. So so this uh, is a permutation matrix. And then you're asking for the entries of this permutation matrix, and then you will get these relations here. Mm -hmm. So, but the classical permutation group uh, matrix would be like well, composed of zeros and one. Right. And like with this uh, sums, uh, so the sums of rows and columns. Uh, being one, and uh, like this, um, that u i j is u i j star uh, is u i j square. So that's like a self adjoint unitary. Um, uh, yeah. So, so, so for, for a permutation matrix, this would mean that that the entry is real and idempotent. So it's just a zero or one. one. Yes. Um, aha. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I was here de defining this quantum automorphism group. And just for historical completeness, let me mention that Julien Bichon, two years uh, before Theo Banica, defined also a quantum uh, automorphism group of a graph. And it's in fact, it sits uh, in between the classical one and the one by, by Theo Banica. Uh, it turned out that this definition has, has better features. So, so this is why this is. Uh, mostly studied uh, nowadays, but I, I just wanted to mention that, that it has some, some predecessor here. So this is our definition of, of quantum uh, automorphism groups of graphs and of quantum symmetries. Let us take a look at some examples. So here's just uh, the definition again, like on the previous slide. An example, let's just take endpoints. So no edges in between. What is the adjacency matrix? Well, the adjacency matrix only has zeros as entries, right? So this relation is empty. U epsilon equals epsilon U. This is, this is uh, satisfied for, for all of these uh, 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 elements Uij. So this means I, I can really forget about this and I, I just end up with the definition of Sn plus. So this means the, uh, 
quantum automorphism group of the graph consisting in only n points is just Sn plus. And uh, we, we convinced ourselves that starting from n equals to four, uh, these groups, these quantum groups are uh, distinct. So this means this graph has quantum symmetries. Okay, so I mean, and this is this is basically the example that I just computed explicitly a couple of slides ago. Sn plus is the symmetry group of n points. So, so this is now the same statement put into the graph language. Mm -hmm. Let us take a look at another graph, namely, namely this guy. So this consists of two segments. Uh, what, what are the, the, the classical symmetries that we can do? Well, we can, we can flip these two points uh, and we can also flip these two points independently. Okay, so this is some Z2 cross Z2 uh, action. So he, here, this is, this is uh, undirected graphs, right? Yeah. Here's my adjacency matrix and you can check that this matrix that I that I wrote over here, that this commutes with the adjacency matrix. So this means uh, I get a star homomorphism from my C star algebra to this universal C star algebra generated by two projections. This is non-commutative, and uh, this shows that our uh, C star algebra is non-commutative, which means again we we do have quantum symmetries. So this this uh, little graph here has uh, quantum symmetries. But if you take a look, for instance, at this graph here, then this one does not have quantum symmetries. So here uh, it's the adjacency matrix. And you can check that from the relations uh, up, up here, u epsilon equals epsilon u, uh, these relations with this very specific adjacency matrix, they imply that my matrix u is of this form. So you see many of the uij's are 0, and all the others are either u11 or 1 minus u11. So that's a commutative C-star algebra, which means that this graph does not have quantum symmetries. So in fact, quantum automorphism group in, uh, is the same as the automorphism group, which, which is just that too. So we have no quantum symmetries here. So, so this proving this equality here is, is, is um, non-trivial, but algebraic, right? Okay, so you, you sit down with the algebraic relations do a number of computations and you will end up with this uh, result, but you have to work a little bit. So it's not, uh, you, you do not need to, to see it right now uh, when attending this talk. So sorry, what is the action of the non-trivial generator of Z2 on this graph? Exchange one and three and two and four. Yes, one, exactly. One and three and two and four, okay. Yeah. Yes, you swap these lines here, yeah. Okay. And is it uh, correct to think that the more connected your graph is, the fewer chances of having quantum symmetries there are? It's it's tempting to to say so because uh -huh. when you when you have many uh, connections, you 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 would probably have have more commutation relations uh, hidden in, in this exactly. in this guy. Yeah. But it's it's not entirely true because uh, if if you take the complete graph, so so mm -hmm. so the one that that connects everything uh -huh. uh, undirected. Um, sorry, or, 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 or here, here I mean the directed uh, complete graph. Again, uh, the automorphism group is just Sn plus, so it uh, mm. it has quantum symmetries. Ah, okay. Okay, so it's more subtle. Okay. It's it's cool. more subtle. Yeah, it's 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 really it's really difficult. So so I, I will I will explain a little bit about some some tools we have in a minute, but we don't have a complete understanding. So in the end. Whenever you give me a concrete graph, I really have to sit down and work hard, and it might be that I uh, cannot solve it. And uh, let me now tell you a little bit about, about some results. So, so now comes the, the survey part of, of uh, this talk. So in the survey part, I will first speak a little bit about this quantum symmetries of, of a graph and this quantum automorphism group that I just introduced um, as such. Then uh, the next thing will be very exciting links with quantum information theory. And in the last part, I will also speak about links with graph C star algebras. So let me start with the quantum symmetries as such. So here's a list of uh, graphs where we settled the question whether they do have quantum symmetry or not. So you might not know all of these graphs, but just to give you an impression what's the state of the art here. So odd graphs, the Hemming graph, Johnson, Knezer, Petersen graph, Moore graphs, and so on. M many of these graphs, they do have, uh, they don't have quantum symmetry. On the other hand, 
graphs having quantum symmetry, these are complete graphs or complete bipartite graphs, cycles, the cube, folded cube, and uh, so a number of other graphs. So um, yeah, it's, this is a list of example. It's uh, up to you what, you, what, you're, what you're doing with, this, uh, with these examples, but uh, it's, it's really, um, we're just in, in, the, in the process of, of uh, producing this list. So this has, has begun by, by Theo Banica and Julien Bichon in, in a couple of papers, um, some maybe 10 years ago, and also, uh, Genevier and uh, Melanie Fulton in, in their PhD thesis. Uh, she, she also did something on this. And then Simon Schmidt, PhD student of mine, who's now a postdoc in Glasgow, uh, he computed many, many examples. And just for fun, let me show you uh, the proof that the Peterson graph uh, does not have uh, quantum symmetries. So this is um, a very famous graph. This, this Peterson graph looks a bit diabolic, but uh, it's, it's a very famous uh, graph. So I think in graph theory there, there are some meta statements like uh, whenever you define a new notion for graphs, check it for the Peterson graph and uh, this will tell you how interesting this notion is or it's good for counter examples and so on. So, so I mean in, in graph theory, uh, usually this, this Peterson graph is, is really famous. I think there's a whole book on properties of the Peterson graph. So it's really um, an important example. And in 2007, uh, Julien Bichon and Theo Banica asked whether this graph has quantum symmetries. And this was, was open for some 10 years. And then uh, Simon Schmidt proved that it does not have quantum symmetries. And the proof is uh, somewhat algebraic and it uses graph properties. And I just want to give you an impression of the, of the proof in order to get a feeling how difficult it is to, to prove such a result or, or what, what you should do when, when you want to prove this. So as a general fact, uh, u epsilon equals epsilon u can be translated to the, to the following relation, namely uh, two elements, two generators from my C star algebra. So now I, I gave strange indices for some, for some reason, but uh, here this u i i prime and u k s, they are orthogonal if uh, i and k are linked by an edge, but i prime and s are not. Or you could say if i uh, and k are not linked by an edge, but i prime and s are. Okay, so if you're in this situation, two vertices are linked by an edge, two other vertices are not, then these corresponding uijs are orthogonal. So this is here written in terms of the adjacency matrix. So this is a very general fact. And specific properties of the Peterson graph are whenever you're in this situation, so you have three points which are, uh, two of them are, are connected by, by an edge, then uh, the other is not uh, connected by an edge. Okay, so you don't have a triangle. So let's, let's pick, for instance, I don't know, this, this uh, setting here in the Peterson graph, and then you see that, that on, on the lower uh, level, these two points are not connected. So this is one property. And another property is whenever you have two points which are not connected by an edge, you will find a third one, uh, such that that's such that uh, these two points are connected with this with this one. Okay, again, let's let's take just some some silly examples. So, for instance, like, let's take this point and this point. So these are not connected by an edge, but you will find a third guy such that uh, both of them are connected uh, to to this third guy. So these are properties specific properties of the Peterson graph. And now uh, let's suppose we have we have uh, vertices i i prime l and l prime such that we are in this situation. So I and L are not connected by an edge. I prime and L prime are not connected by an edge. Then by proper two, we will find vertices K and K prime such that um, the, I hope it's not too small, uh, su such that we have this, this triangle situation here. So now let's, let's take a look at U I I prime and U L L prime. Then I can insert this one because by one of the relations of SN plus, this is equal to one, so I can just insert it. And now let's, let's check what's happening. Okay, I and K, they are linked by an edge, by my assumption here. So this means if I prime and S are not linked by an edge, then the product must be zero. So the only S in the sum that survive are those such that S is linked to I prime. But I can do the same thing on the right-hand side. So K and L are linked. So the only S that survive are those that are linked to L prime. 
But then by my assumption number two, there's only one single vertex which does this job and that's K prime. So this is why I have this, this equality here. And by some similar tricks, I can, I can see that this monomial equals this monomial in fact. And now I replace one part of this monomial by the initial UII prime, ULL prime. And I'm, I'm, I end up with this uh, equality here. This tells me that my UII prime, ULL prime is self-adjoint because the guy on the right-hand side is. And this means that these two elements commute. Okay, so these two generators uh, commute in this situation. And uh, if we do this case by case, then we see that the whole C-star algebra is commutative. This means we have no quantum symmetries. Okay, you don't need to understand all the details of this proof, but my main point here is uh, I use some, oops, um, I use some, some properties uh, of the graph. They translate into certain um, algebraic relations and then by, by some, in the end, pretty easy uh, algebraic modifications, I, I find out that the, that the elements commute. And this means that my C star algebra is commutative and I don't have quantum symmetries. Sir, how do you conclude this commutativity out of this relation? So here, th this, this means that at least these two generators commute, okay? Uh -huh. So UII prime and ULL prime, they commute. But how and does now, it follow from the above relation? Um, so from, from here? Yes, yes. I, I see that my UII prime, ULL prime is self-adjoint. Yes. So, so this means uh, when, when, I, when, I, when I write down this element. Uh, ah, of course, yes. Star, yes, thank you. It's, it's, vice, it's the same vice versa. Thank you. So um, in the end, we, we see that this Peterson graph doesn't have, uh, have symmetries. So uh, the, the whole proof of, of uh, Simon Schmidt is, is not so, so long. It's just, uh, I think, four, four pages maybe. And, uh, but uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was open for 10 years because you need to, to know these, these uh, you, you need to come up with this clever trick in the end. And yeah, if, if you generalize this trick, then, then, then you can show that some of the other graphs also uh, don't have quantum symmetries. Uh, but there are a number of graphs which are which are open, namely uh, these ones here. So in case you, you know these guys, so it's Johnson graph, Paley graph, uh, touch 12 cage. So for the, there are a couple of, of graphs where we don't know whether they have quantum symmetries or not. So if you're interested in specific examples and uh, how to tackle them or what's this, what's the state of the art in a couple of months, then, then you might contact uh, Simon Schmidt. May I ask a question? Sure. What about Dinkin diagrams? Sorry, Dinkin? Dinkin graphs. Um, I don't know whether they, they are all computed. So, so um, I mean, so, so many of them look really like trees, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so for, for, for instance, I, I think this guy is, is, is one of these graphs, right? And um, I mean, it, it, it depends, depends a, 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 a bit. So for instance, su such, a, such a graph uh, he, here, uh, this one uh, will have uh, quantum symmetries. Um, I will come to, to trees in, in a minute, but uh, I think we, we didn't compute the whole uh, list here. So I don't have a general answer. Okay. And uh, here are some tools we can use uh, namely, if a graph has two disjoint automorphisms, then it does have quantum symmetries. What does it mean to have disjoint automorphisms? It means I have two elements in my automorphism group such that whenever one of these uh, automorphisms moves a vertex, the other one must uh, leave it invariant and uh, vice versa. And uh, then the idea is really to construct a representation again, like, like, like we had before with these projections P and Q, and uh, then you will, you will find this, uh, this uh, homomorphism here and can, you can prove that again, it is um, non-commutative. But this is not a full criterion. So there are graphs which uh, have quantum symmetries, but uh, which do not have two disjoint automorphisms. So it's not a complete characterization, but at least it is one criterion that you can read from the automorphism group, right? So you can read something from the automorphism group and you will obtain the existence of these quantum symmetries. But as I said, it's not a full criterion. 
So we have also some, some computer-based tools. Uh, we developed some of these tools. So there's a Syncon type algorithm uh, for testing graphs on non-commutativity. And we also have some computer algebraic approach where you compute certain Krogner bases. But uh, I mean, this is not too far reaching to, to be honest. Uh, so it's, we have some, some tools here, but as I said, in the end, you really have to check hand by hand, case by case. Okay, so I think, Again, there was some activity in the in the chat. Ah, yeah, multiple edges, right? Okay, yeah. Thanks, Piotr. Uh, I mean, Piotr Sultan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so these are, are some tools that that we that we have. But let me also address uh, one uh, question here for for the um, existence of, of quantum symmetries. Namely, given a, a finite graph, we can ask: Does it have quant quantum symmetries? So if we show that the UIJs commute, then we know that the answer is no. And we can use some of our tools, for instance, this disjoint automorphism criterion, and then we uh, obtain the answer yes. But then we're, we're not yet satisfied. Namely, if we know that there are quantum symmetries, this means that the quantum automorphism group of the graph is different from the automorphism group. And then, of course, we want to know it. Yeah? So then we want to, to compute the, the quantum automorphism group and uh, so this means in, in, in this case, if we have existence of quantum symmetries, then we're not yet done. We want to compute the automorphism group, but um, this is um, also a, a very difficult task. Let me tell you a little bit of, of uh, about results we have here, but the list is not too long, to be honest. Uh, so for instance, uh, Julien Bichon already in his very first article on uh, quantum automorphism groups, I mean, from his perspective, but the proof carries over to Banika's uh, definition, he showed that the disjoint product of a graph is the free wreath product of the automorphism group of the single graph with SN plus. So this has a classical counterpart. So you can, you can erase the, 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 the plus sign here and you can erase this one and also the plus sign here. So if you're just in the classical situation, you take N disjoint copies of a graph, then you will know it's uh, automorphism group, it's classical automorphism group, namely it's the free, uh, sorry, it's the wreath product with SN and it has a perfect analog uh, in the quantum setting. And in fact, this, this free wreath product, which was developed by Bichon uh, along the lines of this quantum automorphism groups of graphs, it appeared in, in also other uh, places in quantum proof theory. So it's a, it's a really important product nowadays for, for quantum groups. And you can also ask for, for other products, namely the direct product, Cartesian product, lexicographic products. So there are also uh, some, some results. Or for instance, if, if you take another very concrete example, namely this folded cube, then uh, Simon Schmidt computed the, the quantum automorphism group and it is SO minus one N. If you know this quantum group, uh, then maybe this tells you something, uh, if not, uh, never mind. but it's, it's, a, it's a, a quantum group and uh, this is the quantum automorphism group of this folded cube. But we have, uh, again, a long list of, um, oops, I, I don't know why this keeps changing to the, um, to the eraser. So we have a long list of open problems, namely, for instance, the folded uh, cube with an even number of uh, points, n. So, so n now refers to the dimension. So the picture here is a three-dimensional guy. Uh, the four times four rooks, Hickman Sims. So there are many graphs where we don't know the automorphism group. And uh, one of my favorite open problems in this respect is find a graph such that its automorphism group is the alternating group. Okay, so you just find a graph and the automorphism group is the alternating group. And now if you can show that this graph has quantum symmetries, then I would be very happy because we don't have a definition of a quantum alternating group uh, for various reasons. But um, if you find a graph whose automorphism group is the alternating group, which has quantum symmetries, then I don't know, you could, you could say that this quantum automorphism group is some quantum version of the alternating group, right? I mean, there's also some, some truth in quantum group theory. There's not one single quantum object of a classical object. Very often we have, we have many objects. Uh, that we can say it's a quantum version of the classical one. So uh, I would be very happy in, in knowing such, a, such an uh, example. Or maybe you can prove that whenever the automorphism group is the alternating group, uh, we will always have no quantum symmetries. Uh, I don't know, it's 
this is open. Just a silly question. Can you remind me alternating group is some subgroup of permutations with what property? Um, so I, I think that if, if you if you write the um, the, the permutations in, in terms of transpositions, then it mm -hmm. must be an even number of transpositions. Okay. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are some uh, open questions around, uh, yeah, exactly, the, the only, thank you, Pavel, the only index two subgroup. So here are some probabilistic uh, statements. Uh, namely, there's the, there's the famous and classical Erdős-Rényi result, uh, which I just mentioned before. If you pick an arbitrary uh, graph with, say, a, a large number of vertices, with probability almost uh, one, its automorphism group will be trivial. Or put the other way around, uh, with probability zero, it will have symmetries. So the automorphism group of a generic graph is just a trivial group. So for, for large n. This is a, a classical Erdős-Rényi result, which is um, kind of famous, I guess. And then uh, um, Martino Lupini, Laura Manchinska, and David Robertson in 2017 proved a very nice uh, quantum result, namely also with, uh, with the same probability um, tending to zero, uh, it will have uh, quantum symmetries. So you have a perfect quantum analog of this Erdős-Rényi result. If you pick a generic graph, then with probability uh, one, its quantum automorphism group will be trivial. So clearly, since the automorphism group is a subgroup of the quantum automorphism group, if the quantum automorphism group is trivial, then its automorphism group must also be trivial. But we don't know about the converse. So, so uh, here, that's again an open problem. We don't know whether, whether this is an equivalence. So this means from this classical Erdős-Rényi result, you cannot uh, deduce the, the quantum Erdős-Rényi result, but the converse is true. Okay, so, so the result by Lupini, Manchinska, Robertson is stronger. From this one, the classical Erdős-Rényi follows. So in other words, you don't know if there is a graph whose only symmetries are purely quantum. That's right, yes. So we, we don't know whether there's a graph which has trivial automorphism group, but non-trivial quantum automorphism group. In fact, uh, I, I would re be really happy to, to find such a graph because then it would really show that quantum is, is way cooler, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you can have a graph which has no symmetries at all, but in the quantum world, we will find some. I think this is even more impressive by just saying we find more quantum uh, permutations of, of the vertices if we say there are none at all in the classical world, but in the quantum world, there are some. Yeah. I, I think that there is some hope that such an example may exist. So I talked to a number of people and uh, I, I think there are some, the, the, the feeling is that we might be able to construct such an example at, at some point, but uh, for the moment we don't have it. So let me also mention a less uh, famous uh, analog of Erdős-Rényi for trees. So if I understand correctly, George Hayatz is also particularly interested in, in, in trees, for instance. So uh, if you pick a generic tree, then the situation is ex exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. With a very high probability, it will have symmetries. So that's again a result by Ada Schreni from the same paper. So if you pick an arbitrary tree, it behaves exactly the converse uh, than with graphs. An arbitrary graph, no symmetries. An arbitrary tree will have symmetries. And you can prove a, a quantum analog. And this is what, uh, what I did with Luca Jung, Simon, and Simon Schmidt in 2019. So again, we have a perfect analogy in the, in the quantum setting. And again, uh, our result implies the, uh, the other one. And there's a very recent result by Alex Chivasitu and uh, Wasilewski from 2020 that uh, you have the, the, an analog uh, result for quantum graphs. Whatever quantum graphs are, we will come to that uh, in, mm -hmm. in, in a couple of minutes. But uh, these are some probabilistic statements. Okay, so this would be the, the first part of my, of my survey lecture, namely on the quantum automorphism group of the graphs. And let me now come to quantum information theory, unless there's a question at the moment. I think we're good to go. Great. So let me now come to uh, quantum information theory. And uh, to be honest, this is what I find is, is the most exciting link between quantum automorphism groups 
and uh, yeah, quantum information theory because it really links uh, quantum groups and quantum information theory in a nice way, which uh, was not obvious before. And uh, it uh, is another uh, item on the list on, on this quantum mathematics that all these theories are interwoven. So I, I think this is a very interesting development. And this is where uh, the, the main heroes, I, I think they are uh, Laura Manchinska and David Robertson. Uh, and so, so I, will, I will now uh, come to a number of, of their, their uh, works. So here's uh, uh, something on, which is called quantum isomorphisms of graphs. So let us take two graphs which have the same number of vertices. Then we say they are quantum isomorphic if there is a quantum permutation matrix. So let me write it in this uh, way which intertwines the two adjacency matrices. So recall the definition for the automorphism group of the graph. So here we only had uh, one adjacency matrix. So we had the relations of this SN plus and then this additional relation, U epsilon equals epsilon U. So I'm just taking this relation and instead of U epsilon equals epsilon U, I take U epsilon one equals epsilon two. U, right? So I just use two different epsilons, and uh, this is this definition here. So this is the quantum isomorphism between two graphs. So let us let us get a feeling for for this concept. So for instance, let's take again a matrix V, an n by n matrix, where the entries are not scalars but m by m matrices. So matrix valued matrix satisfying the relations of S n plus plus this one. It intertwines the adjacency matrices. Um, so this would give some, some quantum isomorphism between these two graphs. And if now my M is equal to one, so we're in the classical situation, then this implies that my V is just a permutation matrix and the automorphism, uh, sorry, the isomorphism given by adjoining with V is really a graph isomorphism in the classical sense. A graph isomorphism in the classical sense means if my two vertices in a uh, uh, gamma one are, are connected, then they are also connected after applying the, the isomorphism. Okay, so that's the relation here. So this means this concept over here is really an extension of the classical isomorphism. Namely, if uh, my, um, my representation here maps to, to scalar valued uh, matrices, I really have isomorphism of graphs. So in this way, we, we already proved uh, th this, this implication here. Uh, if two graphs are isomorphic, then they are in particular quantum isomorphic because I can just pick this permutation matrix that does the job. But the converse is not true, and that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are graphs which are quantum isomorphic, but not isomorphic. So here's, here's the easiest example uh, we, we, can, we can find. So I'm stealing this from, from David, who's in the audience. So if you have any objections, it's now your, your, your time to, to speak. <laughs> Uh, so here, here are, are two graphs. Um, they are not really easy to understand, uh, but uh, so this graph up here and this graph below, these two graphs, they're uh, not isomorphic, but they are quantum isomorphic. So it, it's a little bit more structural that this, this, uh, these graphs, they come from a Merman square uh, game or also called uh, linear, line, uh, linear uh, binary constraint uh, system. So uh, there's, a, there's a structural way to, to, to get these, these graphs, but uh, it's, an, it's a nice phenomenon. So there are graphs which are uh, quantum isomorphic, but not isomorphic. So again, the quantum world is stronger. Uh, so this, this, this example here is somewhat the easiest we have, and we, we, we would like to know some, some smaller examples. So for some, some reasons, the smallest example must have at least 16 vertices. Uh, but um, still, I, it's in, it would be interesting to, to know uh, more explicit examples uh, than, than this one over there. And uh, this quantum isomorphism of graphs is linked to, to some game in quantum information theory. Uh, so here's, here comes a non-local game. Given two graphs, gamma one and gamma two with the uh, same cardinality of the vertices, there's a referee and this referee chooses two vertices, A and uh, VA and VB, from the disjoint union of the, of the vertex sets, and he passes it to Alice and Bob, our, our friends from, from quantum information. 
And they reply also with two vertices from, from this disjoint union of the, of the vertex set. And they win if the total number of vertices, so, so these four vertices, two of them come from my first graph and two of them come from my second graph. So this is one condition for, for the winning. And the second is, if two graphs are linked, uh, if, if these two vertices coming from gamma one are linked by an edge, uh, then the two vertices from, from gamma two are also linked by an edge, if and only if. So this is the condition uh, they, they need to satisfy in order to win this game. And you can, you can check that uh, this game, they will win uh, with classical, uh, tools, so, so just described as above, if and only if uh, the two graphs are isomorphic. But if you allow them to share a quantum strategy, so it's a uh, precise definition in quantum information theory what this means. So if they share a quantum strategy, they win if and only if the quantum, uh, the, the graphs are quantum isomorphic. Okay, so this links this, uh, is this quantum uh, isomorphism of graphs with uh, a game in quantum information theory, which is kind, kind of nice, I think. Mm -hmm. And we can uh, even go, go yeah, beyond that. Yes? Um, so like in the definition of quantum isomorphism, um, so I mean, how does this relate, for example, to the quantum, that the quantum groups, the quantum symmetry groups are isomorphic, for example. I mean, like the definition of quantum isomorphic uh, is like, sounds like, okay, like um, taking everything into an ambient C star algebra A and looking at it uh, in there. But like, um, how does this relate to if you take the quantum symmetry group of these two graphs? Are they isomorphic then with all yeah. the structure? Okay, so, so I mean, the, um... <laughs> The, the quantum automorphism groups of the graphs, they, they must be isomorphic if the graphs are quantum isomorphic. Um, that's true, but that, that's not uh, sufficient, right? I mean, it could be that two graphs are, have the same quantum automorphism group, but they're not uh, quantum isomorphic. So just like in the classical setting that the automorphism groups are the same doesn't imply that the graphs are isomorphic. Um, but may, maybe you can, um, uh, maybe answering your question in a different way, just, just the way we, we define the quantum automorphism group of a single graph, you can assign a C star algebra uh, for, for this quantum isomorphism. So that's called the linking algebra. And uh, again, you can ask uh, whether this graph, the C star algebra is non-commutative and uh, deriving, deriving this, this quantum isomorphism of the graphs. So, so how does this relate to, the, to this definition here? Um, so then, um, well, what is the reason of this definition here? Okay, the, the, the reason of this definition here, this, this really comes from, from the classical situation. So, so here, here, here where you would say uh, two graphs are isomorphic if and only if uh, you, 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 have, you, have, you have this uh, condition here with m equals one, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, if you take this, uh, a representation in, in, in this sense where, where, where now all the entries are, are just scalars, then this is really the, the classical definition of, of isomorphism of, of graphs. So, so it has a very natural um, uh, quantum counterpart. And also, uh, if, if, you, if you take a look at this, at this definition of Theo Banneker for uh, the quantum automorphism group, uh, this, this relation is, is, is really very natural and it's exactly the, the, the same here, right? I mean, if, if you now mm -hmm. uh, do it with uh, epsilon one and epsilon two, then you will have a definition of the of the linking algebra, and then you will also have uh, this 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 representation here, right? Mm -hmm. Does does this answer the question or? Yes, I think. I think okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. May I ask a question? Sure. About this definition, is it true that uh, these uh, graphs with uh, isomor quantum isomorphism form a uh, quantum groupoid? Um. I'm not so sure. Um, I probably this has been answered. Maybe, maybe someone in the, in the audience knows the answer. I, I I don't know it for the moment. Okay, thanks. Okay, so 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 this was uh, about um, these uh, David David Robertson 
you, you, you can also characterize Q quantum isomorphism in terms of the quantum automorphism group of the disjoint union of the two graphs. Ah, if that's relevant, okay, yeah, that's right. Yes, uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, but here, here's just, just a list of, of, uh, of uh, further results in, in, in this direction. So, so I don't wanna go through all this uh, definition uh, to, through all these results here. So uh, I, I think, I think the, the, the main point of uh, Laura Manchinska and David Robertson and their co-workers uh, here was, was to link this quantum isomorphism with non-local games and also with uh, the quantum automorphism group of, uh, of the graphs uh, in the sense that I just explained uh, before. But they, they also have other concepts like quantum orbitals or this linear binary constraint games. And this also appears in the work of Musto, Reuter and Verden. They also have uh, uh, some, some work in this direction on this quantum isomorphisms of groups, uh, of, of graphs. So uh, th these are other uh, um, results in this direction or uh, Piotr Soltan, who's also in the audience, uh, associated a C-star algebra to some synchronous games and there are also other uh, games like a graph homomorphism game and bisynchronous games. And there are many results in this direction. So I, I don't wanna discuss all, all these results just to, to let you know that there are these non-local games and you can, you can do some, some nice um, quantum or operator algebraic uh, constructions with these, with these things and uh, a lot of things, uh, a lot of development is, is going in this direction. And uh, also David Robertson and Simon Schmidt have a very recent result. Uh, I, I, I told you before that uh, if you have two disjoint automorphisms, then the graph will have quantum symmetry and they can show if you have three disjoint automorphisms, then it will have something which is called non-local symmetry. And that's a concept which is not uh, equivalent to quantum symmetry. So, so there are also some, some other notions related to quantum symmetry that, that uh, came up. And it's, this, this is a, an interesting notion, this non-local symmetry. So you, I can recommend to, to look at this, at this paper. Um, here you will learn something about really physically observable uh, quantum phenomena and uh, how this is linked to, this, to these notions here. Okay, so these were some, some results on, on quantum information uh, theory, uh, but maybe I'll, let me also uh, highlight a quantum Lovash uh, theorem by um, Laura Manchinska and David Robertson. So what is the classical situation? Given two graphs, we say a graph homomorphism is uh, um, a map between these, these two graphs, mapping the vertices of one guy to the other. And if the two vertices are linked in the first graph, they will also be linked in the, in the target graph. But uh, so if, if I'm, I'm writing an equivalent sign here, then this is graph isomorphism. If I just have this implication, I have graph homomorphism. So that's a very classic concept in graph theory. And Lovash in, in the 60s proved the following result, namely this isomorphism of graphs, uh, you can, you can uh, test it by uh, homomorphism counts. So you take a graph H and then you count the number of homomorphisms from H into gamma one, and you count the number of homomorphisms from H into gamma two. And if these two numbers coincide, for all graphs, then your graphs are isomorphic. So maybe in practice is not a really useful tool, but uh, it's, it's useful for, for showing that the, the graphs are non-isomorphic, right? You just find one testimonial, uh, one, one graph H, such that you have a different number of homomorphisms from your H into gamma one and in your gamma two. And then this shows that the two graphs are not isomorphic. Okay, so this is a criterion uh, of isomorphism of graphs by homomorphism counts. And uh, the question was, uh, do we really need to take all graphs? So maybe a subclass of graphs is sufficient. How about planar graphs, for instance? Uh, maybe that's, that's enough, right? I mean, you just don't need to check all graphs. You only check the planar graphs. And what are they? Sorry? What are they? Uh, so, so a planar graph really means when you, when you draw it here on, on a plane, then the, the edges are not allowed to, to cross, right? All right. So you, you don't have crossing edges uh, when you draw it in a plane. But then the, the, the spectacular result by Laura Manchinska and David Robertson from 2019 shows that uh, the answer is no, planar graphs are not enough because planar graph homomorphism counts, they characterize exactly quantum <laughs> isomorphism of graphs. <laughs> but we've seen already that this is not equivalent to isomorphism of graphs. 
Okay, so this means that we can really show uh, a negative answer to, to this uh, Lobash question, namely planar graphs are not enough. And the techniques for proving this, it, it's really quantum groups techniques. Mm -hmm. So this means you have a classical result in classical graph theory, no quantum whatsoever, but uh, answering this question, you go to the quantum world and you get the answer. So this I, is really nice. This is really nice, yeah, that, that's right. So I, I, I really take this in for advertising that, that quantum helps in the classical world, right? I mean, mm -hmm. in the classical world, we were all wondering whether planar graphs are enough and uh, in the quantum world, we, we from, from the quantum world, we get the answer. And it goes even uh, further, namely in this, in this nice paper, uh, which, which links many things, uh, you, it also links the representation theory of compact uh, matrix quantum groups, uh, so of quantum automorphism groups with the constructions I just showed. What is the representation theory of compact matrix quantum groups? This was my fundamental theorem number four of Voronovich on my very first uh, slides. The representation theory is given by intertwiner spaces. So that's a kind of Tanaka Krein result by Voronovich from the 80s. So Tanaka Krein did this for classical groups, but Voronovich uh, did it for quantum groups. If you want to understand the representation theory of these quantum groups, you need to understand the intertwiner spaces. And the representation theory of SN plus has been uh, worked out by Theo Banica in the 90s, and it's uh, it's these guys. So uh, it's uh, you, you need to understand linear maps which intertwine representations of SN plus. So if you don't know exactly what what, I, what I'm talking about here, never mind. It's so so there's this intertwining relation that that you have to check. And uh, the nice point is that it, it it's a span of certain um, linear maps, which are indexed by non-crossing or planar partitions of a set. So this means now, now, now you have some, some endpoints and some of them are, are linked with each other. And uh, again, if you connect these points, it must be in a non-crossing way. So um, yeah, if, if you want to go further in this direction, you will end up with easy quantum groups. So, so that's, that's my main one of my main research topics, uh, but that's not the topic of the talk today. Now, this is what uh, you talked about in 2015, right? That's right, that's right, yeah. Okay, so I referred to my talk from 2015 here. <laughs> uh, but the representation theory of uh, this quantum automorphism group was a bit unclear for, for uh, a while. So we didn't know how to write down these intertwiner spaces here. And it is an, an, a nice combination of this Lovas um, theory and also the, the, the one by, by Theo Banica here, namely, uh, we, we can define certain maps which are indexed by, hom by graph homomorphisms from planar graphs to, uh, to gamma. So, okay, so I, again, I have these homomorphisms from planar graphs to, to gamma. So like in the Lovas uh, or the quantum Lovas uh, theorem. And again, I have this planarness just, just, just like here for, for the SN plus. So it links these, these things in a very nice way and it gives a description of the intertwiner spaces. So this means this, this uh, very beautiful paper uh, in the end links three seemingly different fields. It links quantum information theory, namely certain games, with a question from classical algebraic combinatorics, namely the Lovas theorem, with quantum groups, namely the representation theory of this uh, quantum automorphism groups. So that's a very powerful uh, article. And uh, this is also, uh, I guess, the highlight of my quantum information theory part. So, so I have 90 minutes, which means I have seven minutes left, right? Correct. Okay, so then, then I would also speak a little bit about graph C star algebra now in the end. Mm -hmm. So now comes uh, links with uh, graph C star algebra. So a very brief reminder what graph C star algebra are, although this uh, is probably familiar to, to most of the people here in the audience. Um, so a graph C star algebra is given by uh, projections and by partial isometries, and uh, they, they satisfy certain relations uh, that can be derived from the, from the graph. And uh, well, this is an object which has been defined in, in, in the 80s, and it has been studied a lot since then. It's also known under Kunz-Krieger algebras, which is a specific subclass of graph C star algebras. Uh, but uh, it is derived from the, from the Kunz algebra, which is also a famous example. So these are, these are objects which, which are really very well studied and uh, I'm, there, there are a couple of hundreds of articles on, on, this, on this topic and it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, an important example of, uh, of C-star algebras. 
And uh, you, can, you can now ask, what, what are quantum symmetries of, of this guy? So what do I mean by this? I'm asking for a quantum group which acts on the C star algebra in a maximal way. And together with uh, Simon Schmidt, we showed that uh, the quantum symmetry group of this graph C star algebra is in fact the quantum automorphism group of the graph. So it's not, not but a now I'm way. confused because all the time your graphs were undirected and here the graph is obviously directed. Uh, yeah, that, that's right. I mean, in, in, in this example that, that I drew, uh, I, I chose undirected graphs just for simplicity, but in, in principle, the whole machinery also works for directed graphs. So I'm, I, I, I did not assume that, that, my, that my graphs are, are undirected, but it, it's, it's true for, for, for most of the computations, uh, we, we usually use undirected graphs, but uh, it's, it, it also works with a directed uh, setting. But and you gave it all in terms of an adjacency matrix. And, yeah. and how do I distinguish by simply looking at the adjacency matrix, uh, the, uh, the graph is directed or undirected? Symmetry of the matrix. Right. Just this. So, yeah. So, so if, 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 if you know that, that the matrix okay. is, is yeah. symmetric, then, then it's uh, undirected. <laughs> Yeah. No. Well, I mean, it can also mean that it's directed, but you have edges going in a symmetric way. Uh, yeah, that's that's right. But this this would be our understanding of undirected. If it if it's uh... ah okay. Oh, this makes me happy. So so an undirected graph is a very specific directed graph where for for every edge going from x to y, there is an edge going from y to x. Okay. Right. Yes. I'm happy. That, that, that's the setting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here, uh, in, in particular, our result shows that uh, this functor associating a graph C star algebra to a graph respects the quantum symmetries, right? Uh, I, sh I, should have, I should have written quantum uh, here. Uh, so so it, it really means uh, if, I, if I take uh, this, this graph C star algebra, uh, it still has the same symmetries or quantum symmetries as, as the graph, right? So, so that, that's, that's what this statement uh, does. And it, it basically um, it goes as follows: we, we take we take a certain uh, concrete left and right action, and it looks looks uh, like this, and we can we can show that um, they exist. So we, we have a left and right action of our quantum automorphism group on this uh, graph C star algebra, and vice versa. Whenever we have any quantum group acting on this graph C star algebra in this uh, way, then uh, we will. Uh, we will obtain the relations of, of this uh, graph of, of this quantum automorphism group. So, so this means it's, it's really uh, a maximal action. And this means this is a quantum symmetry of this guy. There's also other work in this direction by Theo Barnica and Adam Skalski or Joada and Mandal, more in the non-commutative geometry setting, also working with orthogonal filtrations. Um, yeah, just, just to let you know, there's, there's also other work in this direction. And uh, is this uh, quantum uh, symmetry group of uh, C star of gamma characterized uh, in terms of, of, of the C star uh, algebra? Yeah, well, so, so we, here, here we, we really choose this, in our result, we really choose this very specific uh, actions. So, so of, of this very specific form. So uh, Piotr Soltan, who I don't know if, he, if he's still here, he, he, he doesn't like this very particular uh, approach because it, it's too too particular so it, it's a very algebraic and concrete choice for, for this action but uh, if you if you take a look at uh, at this these other papers they, they have more um, um, so some some notions with which are more like like state preserving or something like this so then 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 you could say it's it's characterized in, in terms of, of the sister algebra but I, I think one, one important feature is that that uh, we, we're, we're um, fixing some, some generators here, right? So I, I'm not saying that the sister algebra is such, but I'm, I'm fixing a set of generators. And uh, so I, I, I should probably write, it's the quantum symmetry group of a sister algebra with a particular choice of the generators. Okay, thank you. Okay, so just uh, in, the, in the very last minutes, let me let me refer to a, a past talk uh, given by Christian Vogt here in, in November 2020, which was a, apparently a, a very happy talk. Uh, so this was on, on quantum Kunz-Krieger algebras, and in, in, in that in that talk, uh, 
Christian taught you what, what, are, what are quantum graphs. So, so here's his definition. Let me just uh, steal his slides. It's a kind of recycling uh, talk now <laughs> at, at the end. So that's, that's, that's his technical definition. You can, you can go to YouTube and, and watch his talk and at uh, minute uh, 24, four, six, uh, 64, uh, 46, sorry, uh, you, will, you will see this definition. But the idea is as follows. Uh, a graph we can view as uh, something which has uh, this uh, vertex set and then the adjacency matrix is something which goes from a finite dimensional a commutative finite dimensional c-star algebra to, to, the, to the same c-star algebra. So this is a, the, the adjacency matrix and then the whole idea of quantum graphs is we replace the vertices by any finite dimensional c-star algebra b. Sorry I should have written this this one instead of b and a, a map between this, this uh, finite dimensional C star algebra as the quantum adjacency matrix. Okay, so that's the idea of uh, a quantum graph here. So this, this has some, some long history, the development of this quantum graphs. And to be honest, the really uh, perfect definition or the, the, the definition that, that is, uh, let's say uniform is, is maybe still a little bit in the debate because uh, when, when you take a look at these at these papers the, the definition for a quantum graph is still changes uh, slightly um, so it's a re relatively young field but uh, i think we have a clear idea of what a quantum graph is and the, this is this is the main idea here the question is just which which additional uh, uh, conditions you, you should you should ask for and uh, here uh, you, you can also associate a quantum uh, as a C-star algebra to such a quantum graph. And uh, the main idea is, is something like, like this. So, so you take a certain map S from the finite dimensional C-star algebra, so from the vertex set to, to the C-star algebra, satisfying relations which look like this. So um, again, I, I could zoom into Christian's talk, but I'm, I'm running over time. And um, <clears throat> we have a result that the quantum automorphism group of a quantum graph acts on the quantum graph C star algebra uh, of this quantum graph. Okay, so it's just a similar result um, on what we had before. And uh, this is in our paper from 2020. But maybe maybe let, let, let me end at this point and uh, close close the, the, the session with a couple of references. If, if you want to look up a number of, of things that I mentioned, it's also on my webpage. So you, so you can you can go through this list and read the papers if you, if you want. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So now we have his reaction clapping hands. Okay. Yes, it comes from all of us. And uh, I asked my questions during the talk. So please fire at will. If you still have any questions and comments, just go ahead now. If I may, is there some approach uh, to quantum information applying uh, quantum games to quantum graphs? Um, yes, yeah, so, so David, you, are you still here? I mean, maybe you want to, want to say something. I, I guess the, the answer is, is yes, but maybe you want to be more specific. David. Um, oh, yeah, I'm still here. Um, I, I have been drinking since Trump was no longer officially president, so I don't know how good my answer is going to be. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, um, so if you, you can, I think you can do um, something where you have a game using quantum graphs instead of graphs, but I have myself, I haven't looked at quantum graphs a whole lot. So I, I can't really say a whole lot more other than I think that there are ways you can do that. So you can have a game where instead of having kind of like a, a classical input, which would be like a vertex or something, you can have some kind of quantum input, which maybe mm -hmm. be some kind of vector or quantum state. Uh, but I don't really know a whole lot about that. So I don't want to say anything more, otherwise I might be wrong. <laughs> it's, it's 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 very likely that that uh, you can you can construct uh, games in this direction. That's mm -hmm. that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, second question. Um, what about the interpretation of of the entwining in the context of these quantum games uh, based on uh, graphs? Uh, so what 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 about the context of intertwining? No, no, not intertwining. Entwining. So entwining is a, is a big subject in, in quantum information. And many games are based on entwining. So, so this mm -hmm. Ellis-Bob uh, interchange, uh, mostly in, in, in classical approach to quantum information is based on entwining. 
Do you maybe mean it? Here it would be related to uh, maybe two dimensional representations of, of some non commutative algebras. I don't know. But you, 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 mean, you, mean, you mean entanglement, right? Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, entanglement, sorry. yes. Entanglement. Yes. Sorry, entanglement. Of yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry for that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, is there an interpretation of this entanglement uh, for some appropriate? Uh, uh, appropriately chosen um, graphs, giving the same results as in the classical approach. Mm. Again, maybe David uh, has a better answer. I, I, I will give another answer, but maybe David, you have a more direct answer. Sorry, I, I missed uh, part of the question. So you're just asking if is entanglement involved at all or? Yes. So, so yeah, it, so that's sort of what the, um, like when, we, when you talk about uh, a quantum strategy, for one of these these games that Moritz described, like this isomorphism game, then the sort of the thing, the kind of the extra resource that quantum players have is that they're allowed to share an entangled state, and they can make uh, local quantum measurements on their part of the state, and that's what allows them to sort of perform better uh, than the classical players. So entanglement is definitely involved. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's exactly what uh, what I meant here with with quantum strategy, right? Mm -hmm. So so they, they share an entangled state, yeah. Yeah. So this uh, classical entangled states uh, can be interpreted uh, as some I don't know what in terms of uh, graphs. The the entangled state that they share for the quantum strategy, I don't know. If it can, um, I mean, in, in fact, at least in the finite dimensional case, they essentially always use sort of the same uh, uh, entangled state, which is called the maximally entangled state. Um, so other than the, dim the dimension that they need to use, um, I don't think there's much relation to the actual graphs involved, um, mm -hmm. but I guess you could you could argue somehow that the higher dimension they need to use, the less isomorphic the graphs are. Um, but that uh, maybe that's about it. Um, I don't think mm -hmm. it relates to the graph structure at all because it's always the same um, state once you fix the dimension. Of course, in infinite dimensions, then you get a, it gets a little bit stranger because now it sort of corresponds to some tracial state in the C star algebra, and I understand that a little bit less. Mm -hmm. or a lot less, I guess, than the finite case. So this uh, quantum game is not a generalization. The game this, stays exactly, the, the, the game itself stays exactly the same, this isomorphism game. Um, it's just that the sort of resources or the strategies that the players have access to change. Mm -hmm. uh, so so you, you insert here this, this shared uh, state, right? Yeah, yeah. So the only thing that changed, so sort of classically, what you can think is that the players, um, they, they're just going to use kind of a, a deterministic strategy. So that means that whatever Alice is doing, it's completely determined by what she gets from the referee. So she gets something from the referee and then she responds mm -hmm. just according to some function. And Bob is going to do the same thing. Um, the only sort of extra freedom they have is that they're allowed to use access to some like shared randomness, but all that does is allow them to sort of pick one of these deterministic strategies uh, randomly. So mm -hmm. it doesn't really help them in terms of winning the game perfectly. In the quantum case, what they're allowed access to is a shared quantum state. So this is like a, a vector in some Hilbert space. In the finite dimensional case, you can think that there's like a tensor product structure to the Hilbert space. And one person has access to one part of the tensor product and one to the other. And then they can make local measurements on sort of their part of the state, meaning they can do a measurement on their part of the tensor product. Um, and yeah, but the game itself stays the same. It's just that they have uh, access to different strategies. Okay, so, so the final question. Uh, so if we go with this quantum information and in games, uh, what about quantum computation? Uh, yeah, I don't know if there's like a direct like in terms of sort of like some sort of quantum algorithm, um, I don't know if there's a direct uh, relation to that. These games, they are used for things um, like something, there's this thing called self-testing. Um, 
uh, I don't really uh, do much with this, but Laura, Laura works on this. Um, this is sort of like, if you want to kind of verify that some quantum machine that someone gave you that maybe you don't, you don't trust the person that gave it to you, if you want to kind of verify it's doing what it's saying it's doing, uh, then you can say, okay, well, if I can, if I can sort of win this game uh, with the right probability, maybe perfectly, let's say, um, then uh, maybe that, that might, in some cases that will guarantee that up to some kind of freedom, you really, the, the machine really is doing sort of what it's been promised to do. Um, but that requires uh, some sort of mathematical proof about the specific game you're playing. So the quantum for these isomorphism games, I don't know if there's an example there where, where you can do that, but I would suspect that it's possible to come, like, come up with one. Um, so, I mean, the only sort of like really applied, I think connection is, is this self-testing where you can sort of verify the proper functioning of some quantum device, uh, independent of whether you trust the person that gave it to you. Um, but there's, I don't think there's a specific instance of this with this isomorphism game, but more generally with these kind of, this type of game, there are instances of this. I think there's some self-testing for this uh, linear binary constraint systems. So maybe one can take this to the, uh, to the isomorphism game. Yeah, that I might, mean, something like that might be possible. I, I guess, especially if you allow colored graphs, right? I mean, cause then right. you probably get almost exactly you can get essentially the same game in a certain sense. Yeah. You allow for graphs that have colors on the edges and vertices as the linear system is. So. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else? Well, if not, let me uh, still ask one quick question. I'm just wondering if we could do at least something. I understand that you make these assumptions for a reason. But I'm really unhappy with uh, the situation in which I demand that there's only one edge between two vertices. So what would happen? Can you somehow at least partially generalize that stuff beyond the situation when uh, I just the matrix is just zero and one? Yeah, so maybe, maybe let, let me give you a twofold answer. So, so first, if, if you're interested in just in the, in the graph C star algebra, for instance, if, if those, mm -hmm. on those results, you, you could just pass to the line graph. So, okay. so, so, so the, the line graph means uh, it, it's, it's a new graph. Whenever you have an edge between your original graph, you will have a vertex in your line graph. And the edges in your line graph, they come from the question whether two edges are connected in the original graph. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a bit circumstantial to, to, ex, to explain, but uh, it's, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a relatively easy concept in the, when, when, when you take a closer look at it. And so, so for, for these line graphs, for instance, uh, you can, instead, instead of the, the, the graphs, you can, you can work with the line graphs and you will, you will get uh, um, the same C star algebra. So in fact, the, the, the original Kunz-Krieger approach is, is really more by these line graphs. Um, so I, in their approach, they also only take uh, zero, zero and one entries for, for their matrices. So, so that's, that's, that's part one of the, of the answer. And could, if, could you draw it, what you just said? Just draw me a directed graph and then it's line graph just to see it. Excuse yeah. Me. So, um, I mean, if, if you have, uh, I don't know, a, a, a graph like, like this. So now, now I have two, edge, two edges here, right? So, yeah, but so let's make it directed. I, I want to see arrows. Okay. And uh, then, then now, now I, I need to label these, these edges. Mm -hmm. uh, um, sure. Maybe maybe let's let's take oh, five. So, so so now in, in, in my new graph, I, I will I will uh, have something like like five uh, vertices corresponding to to these edges. Yeah. Uh, and now, um, okay. So let me see. So uh, two and four they touch. So this means between two and four, I will have some edge. And um, how it determine the direction of this edge? Um, yeah, so what is the construction? Or is, is, is am so, I doing um, Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So the idea is simply like, uh, I'm like, so like replacing your vertices by the range projections of your edges. So 
what when x is an edge going from one vertex to another one, then you take your new projection to be x x star. And uh, the other one, for example, y y star. And then like uh, an edge from two to four, so from x x star to y y star, would be just the element, the partial isometry y times x x star. So y the, the original partial isometry like um, restricted to your to the range of the original edge x. So, so that, that that's the C star algebraic approach, right? Yeah. But, but basically I, but, the, the yeah. so but, it's but, like if you have y to x, if if source of y is range of x or range of y is source of x, depending on the convention. If you yes. can if they connect to a path, if y and x connect to a path. But I, I, I think Piotr was also maybe just wondering about the, the, the line graph as such as yeah, a graph. Exactly, thing. yes. That's a, you're absolutely right, Maurice. Yes, I, yeah, I, it's just, 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 just the just graph object. So, so I, I, I think I, I made a mis mistake here. Uh, so it's uh, if, uh, okay, so in, in this example, it's, it's, a, it's I guess it, it seems to be a stupid example. So um, here, so now this two and the four, um, they, 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 meet, they meet here in the sense that an arrow goes in and an arrow goes out. Mm -hmm. And this means that I will have an edge between two and four going in this direction. Yeah, this I understand, yes. And also from three to four, right? Because they yeah. also, also meet here. And uh, likewise from four to five, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so, so something like this, <laughs> does this help? <laughs> And there is nothing from five to four because they sort of uh, meet pointing in the opposite directions. That's right. That's right. So that, that's probably already it, what, 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 I, what I drew, right? So, so probably that's already the, the whole line graph mm -hmm. this example. Yes. And now you are telling me that what? That the, uh, so here I have some graph sister algebra, right? Mm -hmm. And it's even infinite dimensional. And, and uh, now I look at this far simpler graph. And how do I see that graph sister algebra? Um, yeah, so, so if, you, if you take the, um, let's, let's see, if, if you take, take the adjacency matrix of, of, of this guy, let's call mm -hmm. it O, and then you form uh, the, the Kunz-Krieger algebra mm -hmm. uh, of, of this, of this uh, line graph, then this will be the same. So, so this is, let's say, the adjacency matrix of the line graph. This is the line graph, and the original guy was the graph. Mm -hmm. And this uh, shall be the same as this one, right? Um, but uh, that C star gamma is definitely infinite dimensional. And when I look at this linear graph, it looks to me like a kind of a tree, it's a cyclic. So if I would um, ju just normally construct out of it a graph sister algebra, it would be finite dimension. This is what bothers me. But don't, don't, don't you have, uh, what does, that doesn't this give a copy of, of what? Um, I think you have another loop at five. Oh, that's right, yeah, yeah. Yes, now I'm, okay, thank you, Alex. This was brilliant, exactly. Now I, I, I'm inclined to believe it. Without this loop, I wouldn't. Okay, mm. okay, okay, okay. Uh, this, uh, this makes me happy. Okay, so now this is the second part of your answer. Um, yeah, so, so th that's right. So, so what was, ah. Uh, you um, promised twofold, I'm just. <laughs> that's, that's right. Oh, okay, yeah, the, the, the second part is just, just for the automorphism group as, as such. So um, if you, if, 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 you, if, you, if you go back mm -hmm. to, the, to, the, to the very definition of, a, of an automorphism group of a graph, mm -hmm. um, like here, in, in, this, uh, in this setting, we, we really required uh, to, have, to have no uh, multiple edges. Uh, but if, if you want to ask for symmetries of a graph with multiple edges, yeah. you need uh, be, to be more specific on the, um, on the isomorphism of, of the graph on itself. So because now, uh, you, you, it's, it's, not, it's not just, um, okay, so let me see here. This, this is equivalent to saying uh, i and j are linked if and only if phi i and phi j are linked. Yep. So that, that's, that's good enough. 
But mm -hmm. now uh, we need to be more specific uh, if, if we have multiple edges by, by what, what we really mean by, by linked. But you can still um, define some, some uh, automorphism group, but um, you, you can also view it as something like a colored uh, graph. So, so instead of multiple edges, you say you, these edges have colors and uh, your isomorphism must respect these colors. Um, so I, I think you can, you can still define uh, some, some classical uh, symmetry group and uh, for the, for the, on, on the quantum level, um, you can, you, you, I, I think you, you, you will have some, some more relations here, uh, depending on, on this. So probably for each color, you will have an own uh, adjacency matrix, right? And uh, so you have more relations here on, on that side. So you, I think you can still uh, define this object, but um, I think that the short answer is it has not been studied very much yet. And, and, and what would happen uh, if I would just naively take uh, my adjacency matrix without caring that it is uh, no longer composed out of zeros and ones? Um, just naively plugging in there because it's, it's just giving in terms of adjacent matrix. Okay, so I lose some interpretation about linking, but I still have this uh, commutation relation. Wouldn't it be a natural object to study? That's right, yeah. I, I think that's, that's uh, some, something which Theo Barnica at some point might call, uh, what is it, a finite matrix space, I guess, metric space. So then you would just have n points and then some, some distances between these guys uh, are written in such a, such a matrix. So you have, you have a, mm -hmm. the, the matrix is, is, the matrix is written in this matrix. <laughs> and uh, you, can, you, can, you can still define such, such an object. So, so it makes, makes perfect sense to, to define this object, yeah. Um, if I can maybe say so, I think that if you allow things besides zero and one, essentially you get an adjacency matrix for every sort of entry that occurs. And so then you just have this, this relation about the commu commuting with the adjacency matrix, but you have, uh, you have that for every, um, basically for any value that occurs in your, your matrix, you can just make a zero one matrix where you have a one where that value occurs and then you require this commutation. So it's the same thing, it's kind of a colored graph, I think, um, uh, if you allow more than just zero one entries. It doesn't really change things a whole lot, I don't think. Mm. And that's, that's also that answers the question by, by Alexander in the chat, I think. What would happen yeah. if one just replaces epsilon in zero one by integers, uh, then, then, then this would just mean that you have colors, right? So now zero corresponds to, uh, I don't know, black, one corresponds to white and two corresponds to red and whatever. So it's just colors. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, in a certain sense, um, I mean, these colors are kind of already there, right? Because you, you can define these orbits on ordered pairs even for the quantum automorphism group, right? And this is the, and you could just assume that um, every orbit on the ordered pairs gets a different color. Um, and so uh, in a certain sense, these colors are already there. They're just kind of implicit. I think maybe- I don't understand this comment. Uh, how, so, how so, the colors are already there? I, I... So I'm just saying that um, even if I had just give you a, say a simple graph, mm -hmm. um, then just like with the, the classical automorphism group, you can define orbits on ordered pairs of vertices, right? In, in the sense that, okay, there is some, you say that two ordered pairs are in the same orbit if there is some automorphism of the graph that maps uh, the one ordered pair to the other. Where uh -huh. you, just, you just apply the map pointwise. Um, now you can also define orbits on ordered pairs uh, for qu the quantum automorphism group. Um, and then um, what, what you can see is that, okay, well, if I just give um, all of my uh, orbits and ordered pairs a different color. So I say like, so, um, okay, I guess Moritz is bringing up the paper. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I, can, I can color each uh, orbit on ordered pairs a different color. And then I can say, okay, what's, what's the quantum automorphism group of this colored now it will actually uh, necess well, it, it might be a digraph, even if the original graph wasn't a directed graph, it might get directions. 
Um, so what's the quantum automorphism group of this colored directed graph? It will be the same as the original one. Um, so somehow uh, the colors kind of arise just from the graph. Like, so maybe I start with say, um, let's say I start with a seven cycle. So I have seven vertices and I just have a cycle that goes through all of them. Mm -hmm. um, let's say it's undirected. Then the, the orbits on ordered pairs uh, will be sort of the, the things that are adjacent, uh, the things that are at distance two, and then the things that are at distance three on the cycle. Um, oh, and also, I guess the ordered pairs are the things like V comma V. So there will be four orbits on ordered pairs. And you could assign a different color to all those orbits on ordered pairs. And this will give you a colored uh, graph. And the quantum automorphism group of this colored graph will be the same as the original just seven cycle because in a certain sense those colors are implicit because I can't my quantum automorphism group can't map uh, an ordered pair from one of those colors to an ordered pair uh, with a different color anyways mm -hmm. um, now you might be able to get more quantum automorphism groups um, using colored graphs um, that you that you can't get from just graphs but um, it somehow it doesn't really change things fundamentally, um, and you can interpret each of those colors as its own zero one adjacency matrix. So you just take a the adjacency matrix for that color class of ordered pairs, and so you just get the same relation of commuting with the adjacency matrix, uh, but you get sort of many of those, one for each color. So, so in, in fact, I think this also links a, a bit with some some work of, of yours, Piotr. Uh, because I think you, you were also interested in, in some path counts in, in graphs, oh, yes. I guess. Yes. I, I remember from your comments or questions on in Christian Fuchs talk. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so he, here you, you, you basically just take powers of your adjacency matrix and this yes. will tell you certain paths. Yes. And, and it's, it's also the, the same situation here for, for this quantum automorphism groups, these powers of the adjacency matrix, they, they will also tell you something about relations between the certain UIJs. So whether certain UIJs are, are, are zero or, or non-zero, mm -hmm. this you can you can read from the powers of the of the adjacency matrix. So uh, that's that's may, maybe not exactly what David said, but uh, the the powers of the adjacency matrix are somewhat the path counts, and you can you can view them as as certain colors, and they give relations uh, on on the UIJs on the generators. Mm -hmm. But just completely naively, technically speaking, uh, if I have my, my uh, adjacent matrix more complicated, that does it make, uh, um, without interpretation, without colors and so on, just you know, cards on the table, I, I, I have a graph directed or not with an adjacent matrix, which has multiple edges between different vertices. And now I just demand that this commutation holds. Uh, that still makes sense, right? Without any further ado interpretation, it will still give me a quantum group, right? Which will be, okay. And it will still have some nice properties for, for fixing uh, things. I don't know, obviously, if two graphs sister algebras are isomorphic, then their automorphism groups must be uh, isomorphic. So mm -hmm. maybe if you want to distinguish some two strange sister algebras, sister algebras, maybe you look at such automorphism. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. But uh, um, very, very quickly, the, I think the final question, the Teplitz graph, I think, satisfies your assumptions, right? It has, not, doesn't have multiple edges. So what would be quantum symmetries of the Teplitz graph? I don't think we know that, yeah. Hmm. No, even for such a simple graph, it's just as... I mean, okay, so so, so uh, you, you mean for, for the triplets, other algebras like this one, or? And, 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 and one I would go and get, that's the circle. Yeah, that's the density graph. Yeah, okay, so, okay, for, for, for this one, uh, I think it does not have quantum symmetries, yeah. Ah, it doesn't, okay. It doesn't, yeah. I mean, that's that's just my my guess. So I, I think we didn't really compute this example, but um, I'm pretty sure, yeah. No, okay, so, yeah, no, I, the, it, it cannot have quantum symmetry, so, so for, for the following reason, because mm -hmm. this, this quantum automorphism group will be a subgroup of S2+, plus, mm -hmm. yeah. which is just the same as S2, so it must be, um, 
it must be commutative. Yeah, so it yeah. does not have quantum symmetries. Yeah, but by a very simple reason, by the count of vertices, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. And plus one proof is also like uh, the same way, like uh, the proof by Simon Schmidt. So it's, it's, say it again, please. Um, so does one prove this in the same way, or could one prove this in the same way as the one that the proof that you presented by Simon Schmidt on? Uh, no, in, in, the, this, in the, this this very particular case, I I, I think it's easier. It's just, just what what I wrote down here. So the automorph mm -hmm. the quantum automorphism group of this graph will be a subgroup of. Uh, so so maybe this is not really uh, visible. May, must must be a subgroup of uh, S two plus. Yes, yes. And since S2 plus is the same as S2 um, for, for abstract reasons, we know that uh, this quantum uh, automorphism group must in fact be a f come from a commutative uh, C star algebra. So it, yeah. Or, or let, me, let me maybe phrase it differently. For N less than three, less or equal three, mm -hmm. does one prove uh, SN plus equals SN by the same technique as uh, Simon uh -huh. Schmidt on the Peterson graph? No, for, for, for uh, n, n less than three, it, there, there, there are direct proofs. I mean, for, for S, S2 plus, uh, so, so here, uh, okay, maybe let me check a, a blank page. Uh, for for S, S2 uh, plus, oops. Um, so, so, so this is ju just given by, by uh, four elements. Mm -hmm. And uh, since, since you know that one is U11 plus U12, this means that uh, u12 is one minus u11, so they commute, and you can you can also check it for the others. So, so this means in the end the whole matrix is just a commutative, so all the entries commute. Yeah. So so for s2 plus it, it's it's really easy, and for yeah. for s3 plus you, you you must do a little bit more, but it's also just an algebraic and direct yeah. proof. Yeah. I see. Okay. Thank you. Hmm. Uh, Come Sorry. Yeah. Can you come back for, for a while to this uh, orbit uh, equivalence relation? Mm -hmm. You showed this. Yes. Uh, classically, if you have uh, this orbit equivalence, that uh, there is a notion of a stabilizer of a point with respect to the classical action. Mm -hmm. And then the orbit uh, can be written as a homogeneous space. Uh, mm -hmm. I cannot see this picture in this definition of of this of this uh, action of of these quantum symmetries. How far is this uh, quantum version different from the classical case? For this respect, mm. I think I don't know really the answer. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know if, if David, you you, you wanna you wanna comment on that? I mean, for, from from my side, I, I don't have a good answer here. Um, I, I'm not sure I completely understood. I don't know what you um, you said something about homogeneous. I mean, I know what a stabilizer of a, of a point is, uh, but I don't think I understood the the rest. So if I don't know, I might not have a good answer. So so the, so the first question is. Is there an action of this uh, automorphic group on uh, along this uh, along this um, equivalence uh, class? Um, like classical case. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm, I still am not sure what you. I mean, in the in the classical case, is, is the equivalence class of the orbit um, equivalence relation, and or in a sense an orbit of this uh, quantum symmetries. Yeah, yeah. This equivalence relation it does correspond to like so this uh, this tilde one. Mm -hmm. This is equivalence relation. The equivalence classes are the orbits of the quantum symmetry group. Um, and then also for the tilde two, these are these sort of orbits induced on the ordered pairs. Um, like the, the mm -hmm. equivalence classes are the orbits induced on the ordered pairs. You can't really. I think you can't really do it for higher order tuples. No, no, I'm asking only about this first uh, equivalence relation. Okay. Well, the answer was yes. It's, yeah, those are like the equivalence classes of this equivalence relation are the orbits 
uh, of the the quantum monomorphism group of the graph. Um, so what I does mean, it mean? I, yeah, I mean, what does it mean? Uh, um, so I th think there is um, some more general notion of of orbits of a, a an action for a quantum quantum, quantum permutation group um, earlier in this paper. So Martino, I think. Uh, wrote that part because I'm, I'm not as familiar with the all of the quantum group background as Martino uh, as Martino is. So um, I think we just took this to me. Actually, we should I should say that this this notion of orbit uh, is all for just for just vertices is also defined by Banica in a paper that came out maybe a few months before this one. Mm -hmm. So I think we say we should say that somewhere in the paper. Um, so really the novelty of this paper is on ordered pairs um, and, and also the, the connection to mm -hmm. quantum information theory. But um, mm -hmm. so th this, notion, this notion of this tilde one equivalence and mm -hmm. the fact that it gives you these orbits of the quantum water Watson group, I mean, it, I guess you need to decide what, how you want to define the orbits of a quantum permutation group um, in general. Um, but I think we just took this as a definition in the paper. Um, okay, good. Thanks a lot. Well, we should have a coaction and fixed point should be trivial, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, if you, yeah, I mean, I guess you, we, you can also think of like, okay, if you multiply your, um, your fundamental representation, like this, this magic unitary, which has the generators as its entries, if you multiply this by some uh, characteristic vector um, of, uh, a subset of vertices, you want it to fix this if it's uh, in orbit. Right? That, that's what this corresponds to, I believe, if I, if I remember correctly. Okay, Tomek, are you happy? I'm happy. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think it's, a, it's time to end. I'm just cannot resist uh, following my previous question. So what if I would take, because this is just a, like, like a two dimensional ball, quantum disk that is algebra. What if I would take a higher dimensional Hong Szymanski balls? I, I, I'm, I'm looking at the, in my mind, I'm looking at uh, the graphs and even though they look pretty messy, I still believe that there are no multiple edges between two vertices. It's just that, that, that the, uh, we ha you have a path uh, of the longest, uh, well, you have a path uh, on which vertices are aligned and the first vertex uh, maps into all uh, vertices that follow it. So, and then there are loops at each vertex or except for the last one. So I think it would satisfy uh, your definition and you would have now how many, as many vertices as you want. And, and uh, I'm wondering if even then you would still wouldn't have quantum symmetries, quantum symmetries of quantum balls or quantum spheres, where no longer you can just uh, cop out by a uh, simple vertex count. Mm -hmm. but so, I guess so, it's an open question, right? So, so, so uh, the, the, the graph looks, looks, looks like, like this. Uh, then, then you have the loops. Yeah, yeah, true. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 also you you have you see from the top vertex you map to the second vertex, the third and the fourth. From the second you map also to the third and the fourth. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have some further here. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, but I, you still I, have that there is only one edge uh, between uh, any two vertices. So I, I, I wouldn't need to, to think about this more in detail, but I, I, th I think classically this guy does not have any symmetries, right? The automorphism group is trivial of this guy, I would say. Mm -hmm. And I would say the same is true for the quantum automorphism group, but I, because I think that the outgoing paths of, of each of the vertice, vertices are, are different or something like this. Yeah, so, I also think so. So, so, so pr probably by, by by this by this argument, which which I which I just uh, said with the powers of the adjacency matrix, okay, you, you will get enough relations showing that mm -hmm. in the end also the quantum automorphism group of this guy is trivial. So I think the answer is it has no quantum symmetries. 
which is a bit of a shame because these are objects from non-commutative topology, quantum balls, quantum spheres. Mm -hmm. And they fall into your paradigm. I mean, they, they are graphs that you accept. Mm. Uh, and and uh, a JSON matrix is just uh, zeros and ones. Yes, and, yes. And, and, and it, it's, it's not, I mean, because you see, when you look at the, at the quantum sphere from the quantum group point of view, then of course, by the very definition, this is a homogeneous space for a quantum group. It was born out of quantum groups, out of quantum symmetries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 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 uh, uh, here have this discrepancy. Now we look at the graph of say because if you would also make a loop at the last uh, uh, vertex, mm -hmm. it would be the the Weismann Solberman quantum sphere. Mm -hmm. And and uh, so then obviously it gets quantum symmetries as a non-commutative topological space. But uh, you look at its graph and then you say, all right, so let's look at uh, the quantum symmetries of a graph, and then you say they are none. There are none. Mm -hmm. so this is kind of discrepancy which i see here but yeah yeah i'm only thinking aloud nothing deep perhaps no no i i, I see the point but i i, I think that's that's uh, the, the the unfortunate truth but that, that, that some interesting graphs don't have quantum symmetries and yeah. <laughs> okay maybe because I think... they are maybe there's an explanation of for this because it's a quantum symmetry of uh, a datum uh, maybe not, not related to topology. So, mm -hmm. I mean, in, in a way, you're, you're saying that the graph is a discrete object and it has not, not no topology, right? Yeah. yeah. But anyway, on the other hand, it tells you everything about the K theory and uh, including generators. So, the graph itself. The graph itself, but yes. there, uh, but but its symmetries, quantum symmetries especially, are about something different. It's not about topology. Okay, I, I, I've I've got your point. Yes, yes, I think this is a nice conceptual point. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, guys, for your uh, patience. Uh, uh, thank you again, Maurice, for a very nice talk. I mean, there are many many comments uh, in uh, already in. Uh, the chat uh, saying thank you for a very good talk. So let me just voice it uh, on thank behalf you. of most of the audience. It was really great, really enjoyable. And uh, before I stop recording, let me just mention that in a week we'll have Soren Alias. And I only got his title in abstract. I haven't read it, but I, it must be about, uh, about graphs one way or another, uh, I suppose. So uh, it's, it's, uh, everybody is cordially invited to attend. And then we have a semester break uh, after Soren's talk and for about a month. And uh, for the time being, I can only confirm that uh, we will have a talk by Guillermo Cortinas about k theory of levitt path algebras on 31st of March. And the other slots are still um, being filled out. I'm, I'm, I'm working on it, okay? So thank you very much again. I stop recording and uh, I hope to see you uh, next time. Thanks.